they're shooting them they're like dogs. Yeah. Eight o'clock, one freezing morning at the Nepalese border. At 5,700 meters altitude, it seems the time is always frozen. Dozens of Tibetans are walking in line, silently, through the mountains of snow, trying to reach India and see the Dalai Lama, their spiritual leader. The deep silence of the camp, where Romanian and foreign climbers gathered, is killed by a machine gun. Everybody can see a Chinese soldier standing in the shooting position. He opens fire. The bullets hit human flesh. Tibetans fall to the ground. One of them seems to escape the bullets, but is hit by a second round. This footage was taken in 2006 from where thousands of Tibetans once escaped on foot over the Himalayas into Nepal, then India. Now, because of high-tech surveillance methods, only a few make it through the increased Chinese patrols, even on the highest windswept passes. The international community, including government representatives, journalists, aid agencies, they can't enter Tibet and Tibetans inside of Tibet are not able to leave. For a Tibetan in exile like me, I can't go back home, nor can I have contact with my family members back home. The Chinese government has by design locked Tibet down to a point that is, for the past few years, Tibet has been ranked the least free place for political and civil liberties by human rights watchdog Freedom House. Up until 2008, thousands of Tibetans were able to escape. But in 2019, only a record of 18 made it. The occupation, colonization, and the annexation of my homeland continues through various forms of violence, from the political oppression, from the political oppression to the social and economic discrimination, the religious and cultural suppression, environmental destruction. Millions of Tibetan nomads have been displaced and forced into isolated homes with little to no access for a viable livelihood. And 80%, 80% of Tibetan children, some even as young as four years old, are being stripped away from their parents and are being forced to attend colonial state-run boarding schools. There, they're being forced to learn, think, and even dream in Chinese instead of Tibetan. Such political indoctrination is truly a cradle-to-grave system, all to try and eliminate our Tibetan identity. The very Tibetan identity while growing up, I couldn't make sense or grasp because of the pain and experiences of being displaced, not once, not twice, but multiple times, and having transnational families. My grandparents fled from the Chinese regime in 1959, along with 80,000 other Tibetans that followed our spiritual leader, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, into exile. And for me, I was born in South India as a stateless refugee. And within our settlement camps, there was often a saying, whenever a young one dreamt big and said things like, someday I'm going to become a world leader or a beacon of hope. Community members actually reminded us that there was a big R on our forehead. That R stood for refugee. Despite living in privilege compared to our relatives back home, opportunities and resources were still limited. And I got a stark reminder of my identity in 2019 when I ran to become my student un university's student president. 
There was a petition signed by 11,000 signatures within days saying that I didn't deserve to run because of my Tibetan spirit. I received thousands of threats, most likely crafted by the Chinese embassy, of course, but there were death threats, rape threats. They'd constantly surveil me, take pictures, sometimes even follow me into the washrooms. But one thing that still to this day gets me choked up thinking about um, is reading personal messages that said, your mom is dead. I remember having to call my mother in the middle of the day, uh, checking in on her, but telling her everything was fine on my end. Because even in exile, they have come to silence us. The Chinese government spends billions of dollars annually to try and control and infiltrate our communities, to try and intimidate us, to try to sell their narrative and their propaganda, and to silence our calls for freedom. However, that only adds to the constant reminders that I have of my responsibility and duty as not just as a Tibetan, but as a global citizen to continue the work that we do, to continue to love, care, and strive for a world where every one of us is free. Later this year, we'll be facing charges of attempting to pollute, damage, and distort a historical monument in Greek court, a charge that can land us up to five years of imprisonment for simply holding a banner and asking one question. When in reality, the destruction of an historical monument actually happens inside of Tibet every day. After this protest, we spent three days and two nights in jail, but ultimately we got to return home. Unlike Yishi Chudun, who is a retired medical doctor and is still to this day detained for protesting the 2008 Olympics. Hamo, who actually died in prison for sending money to her relatives abroad and thousands of other prolific Tibetans, such as Gosherab Gyatsola, who are imprisoned for peacefully expressing their views. They didn't get to go home. Neither did Argindin Chikinyima, who is the world's youngest political prisoner at the age of six and has not been seen for 27 years, our beloved Pension Lama. Even those who don't live in prison walls, they live in an open-air prison. And Tibetans inside of Tibet have resorted to self-immolation, an act of burning oneself on fire, calling for two things. One, the return of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and two, basic human rights. It's been 63 long years since my people have been home. I stand here today not just as a young Tibetan woman, Chimilomo. I stand here today with the spirit of my ancestors. I stand here today with the spirit of the Tibetans inside of Tibet 63 years ago in 1959 that rose in numbers and swore to protect their land. I stand here today with the spirit of the Tibetans inside of Tibet who get imprisoned for simply holding this flag. So, 
also remember, remember that big R on my forehead? They were right. There is an R on my forehead. But that R doesn't just stand for a refugee. It stands for resistance. It stands for resistance and resilience. Resistance, resilience, and responsibility. The responsibility that each and every one of you here today have to use the opportunities, the privileges to be able to succeed, to engage in meaningful dialogue, and to ensure that the voices inside of Tibet and of every other oppressed people is being amplified and heard by the entire world. Because my friends, the work is still not done. And if we don't reclaim and remember our stories, who will? So let's pick up the phone that you have. Go on Twitter. UN High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet is actually visiting, Tibet, uh, visiting China right now. But guess what? In her four years of, uh, in office, she has not even uttered the word Tibet. So let's tweet her right now at M. Bachelet. Call on her to break her silence on Tibet. Ask about the colonial state-run boarding schools and ask about the whereabouts of our pension lama. To the leaders that are present here, invest in your youth. Invest in the youth that are present here today. Invest in the youth in this world. Because look around. The champions of change are right beside you. We are here and we're ready. So together, let's rise.